Community Webinar Series. We are going to be talking or continuing the conversation of mirrors, windows, and lenses, the impact of early messages. For those of you who were not able to join us last month, don't worry. We have a recording of that session. We'll share the link uh, throughout this webinar so that you can access that. Our speakers are also going to give us a brief recap of what we reviewed during that session and lead us into this one. So if you missed part one, Stay with us, you can still jump right in and then you can revisit that later. Next slide, please. Okay, so for those of you who are new here and have not seen this slide before, I'd like to introduce myself and my colleague, Sawai Lopez. My name is Tondra Richardson. I'm a director in the Office of Educational Equity. We both have the honor of co-hosting this monthly series the Educational Equity Webinar Series. We designed this to foster a learning environment where we may explore paths to empower individual action for greater unity and societal transformation. These conversations are a priority at the University of Phoenix because we serve working adults across all industries in which 56% of these students identify as members of historically underrepresented communities. Throughout these webinars, we facilitate thought-provoking conversations to promote the practice of inclusive leadership in today's culturally complex society. Next slide, please. And now we'd like to begin by acknowledging the original inhabitants of all of the lands on which we are standing or sitting. While we meet virtually, I invite you to join me to honor and give gratitude to the indigenous peoples who were the original custodians of the various lands we each call home. We recognize that a land acknowledgement alone is insufficient, yet it serves as a starting point as we continue our individual journeys toward racial equity. Here in the Phoenix metropolitan area, we inhabit the Hohokam, Akimel, Utim, Pipash, and Yavapai lands. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to honor the original custodians of the land on which we stand or sit. Sorry. Hello everyone and, and welcome. It's, I'm so glad to be here in this hot summer of July here in Phoenix. And uh, we want to make sure that we raise awareness of our cultural and diversity awareness dates of, of this month. It is Disability Pride Month, Minority Mental Health Month, and also we had 4th of July, International Nelson Mandela Day and Disability Independence Day. We are aware that we may be missing some significant dates. So if there's some that are missing, make sure that you add them in the chat and maybe a link to a resource where we can all learn more about them and, and make sure that they're related to diversity, inclusion and belonging uh, topics and, and we can include them next year. So with that, let's get ready for our session today. So let's set the stage for this session. Listed here, you're going to find some guidelines of what we believe are essential to fostering respectful conversations. We believe your participation in potentially uncomfortable discussions uh, may, may just create some, some uncomfort, but those are the spaces where we learn. So, so we definitely encourage you to perhaps be willing to sit in the uncomfort, willing to learn and grow. We want to encourage your participation, sharing of your experiences, sharing of your perspectives, and also be respectful of one another because there's experiences and perspectives that we may not share or, or have in common, but but that's what makes this community, this space so great and so enriching so we can learn from one another and, and really push those boundaries of being uncomfortable and, and learning. So, so definitely want to make sure that we, we foster respect and, and treat, treat each other with dignity. And, um, and then also let's share our LinkedIn profiles. Let's use this space to network with one another and share your any resources throughout that you've come across related to the topic. Let's, um, let's continue learning. So it is my great honor to bring back, and I know Tondra agrees with me, we loved last month's session and we're so excited to have Aaron and Perry join us again. 
And, um, and for those of you that didn't participate, we'll definitely be sharing a link to the recording last, uh, last month's recording in the chat. But let me just introduce again, Erin Beecham. She's an independent equity, diversity, and inclusion consultant and founder of ACT Consulting. And ACT actually stands for Activate, Challenge, and Transform. And I just have to say the they stand behind the meaning of, of this, of how they consult and how they, they join spaces and, and the energy that they bring to the space. So it's an absolute honor to, to have Erin here. She, she has a proven track record of supporting and creating equitable and brave communities. She has been a prior independent consultant and worked at Anti-Defamation League for seven years and also on the advisory board for the Alonzo Crim for Urban Educational Excellence and a number of other achievements that I think if we sit here and, and list the achievements of each of you, that'll be an entire webinar session and we're going to have a whole list of questions for each of you. So that's Erin and Harry, such a wonderful individual. She strives to create communities of respect in schools and neighborhoods through educational workshops and providing these for teachers, staff, parent, caregivers in the community, creating inclusive environments, brave environments, intersecting identities, addressing implicit bias, dismantling positive and negative stereotypes and and my goodness so much more I've learned so much and and just enjoy every conversation that that we've had with both of them so so excited for for them to join us again and excited for all of you in the audience to to get to know them a little bit more so welcome Aaron and Perry hello Sorry. <laughs> technology, technology. Welcome back, everybody. I feel like the band's back together. Like we, everybody that was here from part one, great to see you. Everyone who wasn't in part one, but decided to come for part two to see what all the, the, the uh, fanfare was about. Welcome. Welcome to the family. Glad to have you. And thank you, Sarai. And thank you, Erin, did you want to introduce yourself or say hi? <laughs> hi, everybody. Thank you, Perry. You were breaking up a little bit. Perry and I are sitting in some storms. And so hopefully our internet um, will not be going in and out, but we will absolutely jump in as we can. Um, just again, thank you, Tandra and Sarai, for this partnership and for the invitation back. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm ready to dive in and um, talk about early messages. All right, let's go. And also just to let you all know, um, our webinar star style, for those of you who are not able to be part of, um, join us for part one, our webinar style is a little bit different. We do want you in the chat. We do want to hear your perspectives. We do want to, we're going to talk about your cultural groups and your early messages. We want to hear who you are and read who you are. Okay. So please create community in the chat. We are all in this conversation together. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit, our style is a little bit different um, in, in order to, to be a little bit more interactive, okay? So we will jump in um, and go to our first slide. For us, we are an Atlanta-based crew. I feel like I need to be directing to, and on plane. Um, and we want to acknowledge that we are sitting on Cherokee and Muscogee tribal nation. Um, and it was amazing. I always love hearing. I saw also in the chat, someone else was noting the, the land that they sit on. So part of being a part of community and building community is understanding how we got here in, in all of that history, positive, negative, in order to create progress. So shout out to, to our, our nations as well. Um, next slide. So the way that we as ACT, just to give you a little bit of information about us, we activate, challenge, and transform. 
right? So we activate through dialogue, through personal growth, through connections. We challenge inequities, uh, challenge language. We believe that language is extraordinarily powerful. And we challenge our biases. Bias is universal. We also transform. We transform ourselves. We transform systems. And we transform cultures, right? Culture and climate. Defining it first in order to transform it. Next slide. So just a few of our activator uh, beliefs. Um, we won't, because of time, there's never enough time in this work, always a constant reminder. We believe, as I said before, that language is powerful, that change requires action. We listen to learn, even existing in that discomfort that Sarai uh, mentioned before. And we also believe that prejudice and bigotry can be unlearned. So these are a few of our activator beliefs. We encourage you to go to our website to learn a little bit more about us as individuals, as well as what um, activators, as we refer to ourselves, not just facilitators, but activators uh, do, and how, how, how we got into this work. And next slide. So in our last session, we talked about windows, mirrors, and lenses. Um, it's also obviously the name of our session. With mirror work, who are you? What are your intersecting identities? What are the biases that you implicitly and explicitly bring to the table? We all have biases. Acknowledging that bias is universal, it's also part of our responsibility to discover the roots of our biases and take the opportunity to do the self-reflection in order to dismantle them. With lenses, lenses create the filter through which we see or don't see others in the world. It's how we analyze. Normally, normally, we actually analyze before we take that pause to reflect. So in, in engaging in conversations like this, we're trying to, to interrupt that own personal system. With Windows, how much are you educating yourself about the daily lived experiences of people outside of your community? Those people who don't share your intersecting identities. Especially, I know we have some educators in, in our group today. What intentional moves are you making to expose other histories, cultures, levels of existence to your students? These are just some of the tools that we use in order to create lasting and sustainable change in our communities. But it always begins with awareness of self, doing the mirror work. Next slide. So in our last session, we talked about culture. What is culture? We defined it as meaning the patterns and characteristics of human behavior. It's one collective term of religions, beliefs, social norms, defaults rather, arts, customs, expectations, and habits that we possess. Um, in our last session, we had the opportunity to name some of the cultural groups that we were participating in in our session based on location, place of birth, age, religion, and race. And let me tell you, that group, you all, that was amazing. We The level of diverse cultural groups that we were, we were presenting with and that we're joining our community heavily informed our conversation from sharing personal experiences related to everything from familial relationships to vulnerable moments informed by trauma. It was an amazing group. And I know this group is just as amazing. So from here, we are, we're gonna get into it. Are you all ready? <laughs> all right, we're gonna talk about the cycle of socialization. Less. Okay, come on. I see that. You all are ready. I love the enthusiasm in this chat, you all. Okay, so the cycle of socialization. Not sure if any of you all have are familiar with this or have heard about it before, um, but if, you, if you're new to it, welcome. We asked who your first socializers were in our first session and what was happening in your home, on your street, in your neighborhood, and globally that helped inform your world use, right? So that's basically the first two parts of, of the cycle. In today's session, we want to focus on the next parts of the cycle of socialization that includes how messages are enforced and how and where we can break the cycle. Just a reminder, when we talk about the cycle of socialization, we are entering at different parts at many different times, right? So it's not, not necessarily always a conform, con, confirmed path, um, but it's always going to be a cycle and circle. So in this graphic, we lovingly borrowed from our friend Malia Dunn, who's actually, uh, I believe she's within our community today. Um, so thank you so much. And it was adapted, excuse me, um, from... Um, from Bobby Harrow, sorry, but let's let's briefly explore and look at the cycle. And also, if you all have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. 
and shout out to Malia. <laughs> Aaron? Yeah, so just as Perry said, um, last month we really dove into the beginning, who were your early socializers, and now we really want to look at the enforcements and the results, right? Like, and then we'll even get into the, the sort of second half uh, or the, the later half of the cycle of socialization. And so just like last month, we've got some questions. Um, and again, thank you to Tandra and Sarai for even you know, joining us with and answering some of these questions. Um, and as, as we're doing this, we also, again, as Perry said, we, we ask that you all put these in the chat as well. And so I, I think for me, one of the, the best things about this cycle of socialization is that you can look at it as a whole, right? Like you can look at it as one really big resource. Um, and then you can take the opportunity to look at it through different lenses. Uh, again, the power of language, right? And so um, I recently did this uh, actually with Malia, um, another shout out. And I dove into the cycle of socialization looking through the lens of um, socioeconomic status, right? And really diving into it from, from that perspective. And so as we sort of think about this, and as we go back to the definition of culture, um, look at it as a whole, as, as one culture, and then take different parts of your identity, take different parts of the cultural groups that you belong to, and dive in in that way, whether that is your racial identity, whether that is your sexual identity, whether that is socioeconomic status, whether that is religion. And so think about some of those cultural groups that you belong to as we dive into kind of the um, enforcements results uh, part of the cycle of socialization. Um, and I think that's a really interesting part of that. Um, I uh, heard from a keynote speaker who was a, I think he's a neurologist. And so for like an hour and a half, uh, he talked about the brain, um, which was like super, sorry, I don't know what that was, super, super interesting to hear about kind of how the brain functions. But one of the things that he talked about was stories drive your perceptions. Um, and I thought that that was really powerful as we're talking about early messages, where we got them from, and um, how the brain either works uh, moving up or moving down, right? And so using these shortcuts. And so just to say, Think about those stories and think about how they have um, sort of uh, driven our perceptions. So the first, we have, of course, lots of questions. Perry and I always have way too much stuff in the amount of time. And so we're actually going to start with two. And then depending on the time that we've got, um, uh, we'll sort of dive into some other ones. But the first, actually, I'm going to put the first two questions up because I think even um, some of the stories that Perry and I even prepping for today. Um, uh, Perry and I have known each other for almost a decade, and yet we still prep for some of these uh, webinars and learn about each other every single time. Um, and so even the stories that kind of came out of this, it made me think about putting up both of these questions at the same time. And so the two questions to consider are, some things you were encouraged and discouraged to believe about the people in your cultural group, and then some things you were encouraged and discouraged to believe about people in a different cultural group other than your own. Um, and, and there were two stories that, that came to mind uh, for me, and so I'll quickly share both as Perry and Sarai and Tandra are, are possibly thinking about their own stories. Um, and the first one I, I actually talked to my mom about, and I got permission to, to share this story um, from her. Um, and she said, it's a great story. And I was like, well, I, probably not a great story, Ma, but like one that we can really learn from. And she's like, yes, that's like, that's what I meant, right? Um, but she tells the story of uh, being in her college dorm and waking up because her roommate was feeling her head for her horns. Um, and it was because of the early messages that she had received, that her roommate had received that uh, Jewish people had horns. Um, and 
you know, thinking about it. So my mom, obviously, she would say that she is celebrating her 22nd birthday um, again. Um, just like Perry, I think you celebrate your 29th. But knowing that that is her, um, a story that has stayed with her for decades and, and the impact of that. And I'm actually going to go back, if I can, um, to because I think it's really important to sort of think about the cycle of socialization as we're having these conversations, right? Like, where did that early message of, of um, the Jewish community come? And the fact that somebody uh, felt like they could, one, touch somebody else's head, right? Like that physical um, uh, invasion, um, and then also just all of the stereotypes uh, of the Jewish community and how that uh, impacted my mom long term. Um, and so that was one of the stories that that Perry and I uh, shared as we were sort of uh, talking about the cycle of socialization, right? Um, and the other one was my my own stories that I received. And so I played basketball in, in high school. And um, some of the even nonverbal and verbal messages, the again, the enforcements part of, of the cycle of so socialization was, um, I'm a private school kid from Atlanta, and the, and the schools that we played were predominantly Black schools on the south side of Atlanta. Um, and whenever we would go and play these, um, these schools, the messages were get off the bus, go play and get back on the bus. And there was nothing else, right? There was no sort of in between um, and even the different messages that we received going to either predominantly white schools or other independent school was, yeah, after the, after the game, you can go into the gym, you can see your family, you can see your friends, you can hang out. And you know what? Like, we're gonna go when we go, right? And the difference in those messages, again, either the um, some of them nonverbal and verbal messages of um, the the stereotypes and the the quote unquote danger that we were in going to um, a predominantly black school or a, a neighborhood, um, and again how those reinforced as we, now we're looking at the results reinforced the lack of reality, right? Reinforced uh, this internalization of power and that we were better than. Um, and so for me, those were two of the, of the stories that as we were looking at the enforcements and the results part of the cycle of socialization um, really stuck out. And so, um, so Perry, Sarai, Tandra, anything else um, that, that about these two, these two questions? And I'll put the, the questions in the chat as well. One of the things that I wanted to, as I'm looking at, at um, responses, um, and we're talking about the power of words, reminding everyone um, that we can have a lot, and, and these stories and the level of vulnerability um, are going to evoke feelings. And we are allowed to have multiple feelings. Um, happening at the same time, the word sad keeps coming up in the chat. And I want us to think of other, yes, that that, that story is sad in that um, Aaron's mom is, is, is reliving and remembering um, at her ripe age of 22, the impact of someone violating her body right? That there were multiple, multiple layers to that story. There was, a, there was a violation of body, there was stereotype, there was anti-Semitism, there was ridiculousness, there are all these things. But as we're trying to, to uncover the, the layers and the early messages that we've received, let's get into the bigger, the big feeling words, the, the nasty, disgusting feeling words that are happening as we're remembering things, okay? Um, Sorry, I think I think Tantra was trying to speak. I apologize. I wasn't, but I guess I'll speak. <laughs> uh, Aaron, can you fill the questions up again? I'll just like go off the cuff here. Um, some things you were encouraged and discouraged to leave about people in your cultural group. Well, I'll uh, speak on one that was and am encouraged um, is as a black woman, I'm supposed to be strong. I'm not supposed to show vulnerability, weakness. Um, I'm supposed to be resilient. Not a fan of the word resilient. 
Um, so that's one of the things. And that came from inside my family and still, and it's still present. There's a lot of uh, generational beliefs there that are passed from one generation on to the next. Um, and then I see that Trina says, yes, the same, but Trina, let's change that narrative. Okay. Um, because a sister can be weak sometimes. Um, I'm not always strong. Uh, some things you were encouraged and discouraged to believe about people in a different cultural group than your own. Um, it, it's very funny because I, my mom is biracial. Um, I've shared probably in this webinar a few times, um, to see her, you would see a white woman with red hair, uh, but she is biracial. Um, so even though my mom presents that way and that's the way that she looks, um, and she could almost pass or she could pass, um, I was always encouraged to believe that I couldn't trust white people. Um, so that I always had to kind of be on guard, watch, listen, and pay attention because there is no white person to be trusted. Um, so those were some um, things that I was told, a lot of untruths. Sorry. You know what comes up for me as far as encouraged to believe about people in a different cultural group, and I saw it come up earlier as well, is uh, this negative stereotype about individuals with tattoos. And uh, I, I grew up in, my, in a very conservative environment. And I remember my mom seeing people come pass by if they had a tattoo, just grab, pulling me closer and, um, and always saying, oh, they have tattoos. And um, as if it's something negative. And, and it's, it's really something that, that stuck with me up until I went to college and my best friends, all they all went to get tattoos. I still, to this day, do not have a tattoo yet. It's my next thing to do on my bucket list. But, um, but it came up and I remember when I was in college and I was 20 years old and and really sitting down and trying to think, why am I scared of someone with a tattoo? If it's beautiful, it's a piece of art it, it, and it's meaningful and really trying to unlearn that message and, and, and really grappling with, well, was my mom wrong? Why? Why? And, and it's those things that you start questioning. You don't realize that, that it's, it's a moment of unlearning that as simple as of an example as tattoos. Um, and I think to this day, there's still some negativity. It's, it's not as much as it used to be, but to this day, you still see a lot of that. One of the things that we have a lot um, going on in the chat, and thank you all for, for being willing and being so vulnerable, there's a lot of um, gender stereotypes, reminder that stereotypes can be both positive and negative, um, but a lot of you all are talking about the gender stereotypes that you've grown up with, um, referring to, to uh, kids that identify as girls as good girls. So if you're a good girl, you need to dress a certain way, you need to act a certain way, you need to be quiet, right? If you are a, if you identify as a mom, you're supposed to be, be, be someone who is cooking and cleaning and able to multitask and be the, the best at everything, right? So there's these additional layers and levels of pressure and value, right? That we are taught and thinking if we're, as we're even reading through the chat, who taught you these things? What are the issues and what are, what are the level of trauma sometimes that the people, whether was it your parents, was it your another family member, a caregiver, uh, a teacher, um, a religious leader, a friend, somebody else, you know, the, in the neighborhood, what are the things that they were also exposed to? So as we're talking about the unlearning, a lot of this unlearning is generational. Another stereotype about men, men are not supposed to cry. Um, something else was written in the chat. Someone said that they were taught that uh, men were abusive, right? That's, that's a lot. That's heavy. And that comes from someone who, who was not feeling the ability, not able to also unpack some of the messages that they received and the experiences that they had in their lives. This, uh, thank you all so much. This is, this is, this is amazing. 
Um, we have a lot of tattoo people. <laughs> I, and I am someone who has tattoos and wears them proudly. I remember I got a tattoo and uh, I have a, a, an 11 year old and he was like, mommy, what is that? I was like, it's arm art. It's arm art, right? So what are the ways in which we are able to express ourselves in but whether it's gender expression, whether it's expressing art on our bodies, history on our bodies, and being able to embrace that, accept that. Yes. Oh, someone said armor. Yes, arm art, armor. I love that. That's amazing. We got someone got 50 tattoos and they are not done. Shout out. That's incredible. I love it. Someone said that they were raised with their grandparents and they did the best they knew based on how they were ushered around the world. That is an absolutely true statement. At any point in time, all of us are, are trying, striving to do the best we can. And obviously, because you all are choosing to be here today, whether you're voluntold or volunteered to be in, in this webinar, you're also trying to be better humans, right? We are trying to engage on different levels with each other and building community. Someone said, my school taught me the mom thing. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a heavy, that's a heavy, when you all, if, especially if you all are parents or caregivers, um, understanding the small things, the pressures that happen in school, uh, whether it's banning books or um, on a, a form, it says mom's name, father's name, instead of caregiver number one or caregiver number two, the subtle messages that we get at a very young age, how we describe family, right? So, seems so small, but just how, how the lack of representation can feel, make sure that someone doesn't feel represented, someone doesn't feel seen. Um, someone said that they got a message, people are fat because they're somehow lazy, weak, or not smart enough. Wow. Messages about body shaming body shaming. They said that one still speaks to me every time I look in the mirror. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hopefully in, in by having these conversations, we're able to break that down for all of us, for all of us. So what were some things that you were um, encouraged and discouraged to believe about people in a different cultural group than your own? And Perry, I'd love, uh, there was something else in the, in the chat and somebody said, I, it sounded like they, they called a family meeting and, and, and said, Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna have a conversation. Right. And, and I think if you still have, um, parents in your community or caregivers or whatever, and you can literally have that conversation with somebody, how powerful that can be to, um, to just say, we're okay. Like you taught me this as my caregiver, where did you learn that from, right? Um, and again, I think it's, because uh, we're gonna talk about breaking the cycle in, in just a little bit, right? Um, but we, I think having those conversations can be so powerful, um, you know, to, again, like I had it with my mom, right? Um, and when I started diving into the socioeconomic stuff of the cycle of socialization, my mom and I had a really, again, hard conversation, right? Like, but even, even with those conversations, there was growth there. Um, and so Perry, I, um, sorry to, to take us in a, a little bit of a different direction, but I thought that was really powerful to say like, yeah, I, it sounds like somebody was like, we're gonna have a family meeting and we're gonna, and we are going to like have these hard conversations um, because I also want to know like where, like where this came from, right? What's the history behind some of that? So I thought that was, um, that was really powerful. So, so pick, go, yeah, I see you unmuted. Go for it. Well, I was just going to say, you bring up a point, a great point that, and, and someone, someone else in the chat named it. Sometimes we fall into the, the gap of using the excuse of, well, that was in their time, that was all they had, those the, that was the box that they were put in, and it's a yes and. So as activators, Aaron and I believe, you know, in not just being able to experience multiple feelings at once, but multiple truths as well, right? Existing in the yes and. Yes, we can acknowledge that there was a time and a place, um, unfortunately, that 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 people weren't feeling as free to be who they are. And if you know better, you do better. So being taking those moments of saying, we're going to have a family meeting, or I'm going to sit and I'm going to ask you where that came from. And then I'm going to say, wow, I'm sorry that you did not feel like you were able to truly sh show up authentically as yourself. And I want to be that person for you. You can show up authentically for me or mom, 
I don't really like it when you criticize my skin or my hair or my nose or the way that I dress, right? Being able to, to have the multiple truths, honoring how someone else exists. And also I, I would like for you to treat me how I want to be treated, right? It's no, we're not doing the, the golden rule. I think it's called the platinum rule now. It used to be treat other pe treat people how you want to be treated. No, treat people how they want to be treated. And so Perry, I think, sorry, Sarai, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I, I just actually wanted to add on to that because I feel like sometimes we may shy away from having these conversations because we feel like we need to know everything about our own identities and, and, and just in case it comes up within the conversation. And knowing you don't have to be an expert in the topic, just being willing to sit there and and explore and be curious together, that's a start. And, and look it up and do the research as a group, as a whole, and, and learn from one another. Because I, I think we sometimes, because it's so uncomfortable to create a space where we can have this red table talk type of conversation, that oh, the idea of that alone is can be scary. So then we can sit in the comfort zone. Well, I don't know everything about it, so I'm just not going to join. We'll take that leap of faith and join, knowing that it's okay that you don't know anything about it. It's okay that you you shouldn't, and it's okay to not have to represent a whole ethnicity. You don't have to, and and you shouldn't. Let's learn together. And can I just add, sorry, I don't know. First of all, I, I know I maybe share in the chat if you're familiar with this. Have any of you heard the pot roll story? Okay, Perry's heard it. All right, I'll share it. But I think um, what happens to Saray's point is like sometimes we just carry on doing the same thing that generations ahead of us have done out of respect for them because it's tradition, you know, but sometimes we just need to be curious enough to ask questions. That's really a good way to facilitate these conversations. I think someone in the chat had shared, you know, it ends up in an argument. Sometimes when someone is telling you this is the way that it is and this is how you should feel about men, this is what your role as a woman should be, then ask well, you know, grandma, papa, whatever you want to call them, where did that come from? Like, where did you learn that? And then you can share your experience. And sometimes you'll be able to kind of cross that barrier. Like, well, this is how we're doing things now. This is what I'm juggling now, you know, and that's what you did in the pot roll story, just to kind of make it a, kind of short. There is this kind of like generational thing, um, basically, where this husband is watching his wife make this pot roast and she's cutting the ends of the pot roast off and putting it into the crock pot. And so he's like, well, why are you cutting the ends of the pot roast off? Um, don't mean to offend anybody who's vegan, but you know, um, I'll get all the disclaimers out there. Um, so um, she's like, well, because that's the way my mom always did it. And then she thought about it. Well, let me ask my mom, like, mom, why do you always cut the ends of the crock pot or the uh, pot roast off before you put it in the crock pot. And she's like, because that's the way my mom always did it. So then they ask grandma. So grandma says, well, I cut the ends of the pot roast off because the meat wouldn't fit in my crock pot. So that just goes to show like we just continue things on without even asking why. Think of all the meat that was wasted off after all these years because no one asked the question, why are you doing that? It's very, it's a funny story. When I first heard it, it was like so true because we do so many things because that's the way it's always been done or that's the way our generations before us said it, it had to be done. And we thought, okay, we have to do it this way out of respect. So just wanted to drop that little nugget into that conversation. I love that story. I don't, it's not my story. You can Google it. It probably is a little longer than that. But when I first heard it, I'm like, that is great. What's interesting is that someone in the chat said, I heard this as a, as a turkey at Thanksgiving story, right? So like 
talk about these cross-cultural communication, you know, this, the ways that stories get translated, it's always going to be a different food. Um, but the meaning behind it is, is, is the same. Somebody heard about it with ham. Um, but I also want to shout out our, our um, fellow community webinar members. Um, there's a lot of support that is happening with you all. And I love the freedom that you all are, are having with um, the things that you're having to unlearn about yourself and what you've been exposed to and the ways that you all are, are strangers and already supporting each other and sending each other hearts. And that's what this is about, quite honestly. This is the the be, the able the ability to have these early message conversations and figure out you all sat with some strangers here and you all are telling amazing pieces and sharing pieces of your intersecting identities with us and supporting each other all at the same time. We can do hard things, you all. I love it. I love to see it. <laughs> and I think Perry, one of the things that somebody said is I wrote it down, curiosity fosters connection. Um, and again, I think that was such a, a powerful, um, I, I, I'm going to write a book with all these like little nuggets that y'all like from this month and last month, um, I think last month, the one that uh, somebody said was no is a, a complete sentence. And I have like used that uh, many, many times. And so I love the curiosity fosters connection um, part of that. So we've got a bunch of um, other questions, but I think there's one more and then we'll kind of get to um, some of the like, what do we do uh, things. But I think, um, and we'll send this out as a follow-up, but I think I, it's really, I, it is a powerful thing to, to look in the mirror about is the, the very last one, first contact with or awareness of people in a different cultural group other than your own. And again, looking at that through um, a, a racialized lens, looking at that through a religious lens, right? Like uh, had my mother's um, roommate or whoever it was ever met someone who's Jewish, right? Was my mom the first person that, um, that she had ever met? Um, we have this question, Perry and I ask um, uh, teachers or students all the time, when was the first time that you had a teacher of color? If ever, um, for all the white folks on uh, the webinar, when did you realize that you're white? Again, if you haven't, uh, you know, reach out to us and we'll have this conversation, you know, a little bit more in depth. But um, when did you when did you have that realization? And again, I think uh, for me, again, it was. Um, going into some of these predominantly black schools, um, playing basketball, whether that was in middle school, whether that, that was in high school. But even like, please note that I just said middle or high school, right? And how important that is that um, I was 12 or 13 when I had that realization of, oh, like my existence is very, very white um, and going into other communities or in this case, other gymnasiums, that was one of the first times that I had that sort of first contact or awareness of, um, of somebody that was a, a different race than me um, because there, um, there, there were a handful of other students of color at, at, my, at my middle school and high school and even elementary school. I was just going to say that that also goes back into who are your first socializers, right? Because if you're not figuring out what that level of identity means, especially as it's considered a default identity and you weren't finding out at home, it's when did I find out and why didn't I find out earlier? <laughs> like there's always the follow-up to it, right? Why weren't you talking to me about who I am, right? When we're existing in homogenized environments. Oh, wait, we got some great stories here. I don't think we're gonna, you all, there's never enough time for this. There's never, 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 never enough time for this. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to go to our next slide. <laughs> So letting go of myths is not easy because it means that we have to admit to ourselves that the stories we live by simply aren't true. What is the impact of that statement on you all? 
And this, by the way, this is coming from Shani um, Jen Wright. Uh, this is a book that Aaron and I uh, read and highly, highly recommend. It's called The Four Pivots. Um, it, it, with regard to reframing how you do this work, um, highly recommend the book. We're not paid to say that or have any sponsorship deals or anything, but it is an amazing, amazing book. Um, but I do want to ask Tandra Sarai, what do you all think about this? Letting go of the myths right? What you were taught about yourself, about other, other cultural groups. You know, this is such a powerful quote, and it, it just brings me back to what uncertainty creates and that level of instability that, that comes through and why there's so much fear to unlearn because of the unknown. And, and I think we can all relate when COVID happened, there was so much uncertainty. We, it just, everything flipped upside down and we weren't sure what, how things were going to change. And it just created so much fear and distrust of one another. And in just this statement alone, just makes me think of, it's okay to not know. And, and being so mindful and present that that it's those emotions that not unlearning will bring up a lot of deep, deeply embedded emotions and, and that's uncomfortable, but it's okay. And it's part, it's this process it's, that's phase and it's not a one and done you're it's it's an ongoing ongoing effort so so yeah it just hits so many things I love this I think for me I'll relate this most to like the, my history right as I'm growing older and learning more I'm learning more about what I didn't learn um and there is, um, just to be completely, completely vulnerable in doing this work, there is um, some insecurity there sometimes because it's like, well, do I even know who I am or where I came from? You know, I was taught about the Mayflower, you know, I didn't know about genocide. Like I, 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 there were all of these things that I was taught and I could recite and I used to be proud of as a kid. And now it's like, there's so much that I don't know about myself. Um, and I, I've, I've said it here on this webinar, and we did a series on the 1619 Project after I had first read like the New York Times um, articles um, before the book came out and, late, and later read the book. And it just, reading that book just brought so much realization to the point that I wanted to enroll in school just personally to learn more about who I am, where I come from. Um, and I think that that is probably the hardest thing because you get to a certain age and you're thinking, you know, you have a certain level of intelligence and education, but just to be completely honest, um, all of that early education was all wrong you know, and then to know that now we're living in a world where they're trying to make sure that our kids can't learn, you know, we have to teach them at home, you know, those things that they're not learning, but my parents couldn't teach me because they didn't know either. Um, so I would say that would be the, the hardest thing. I think that I thank you so much for that, Tandra. I think part of that, the I don't know, um, as people are, are discussing in the chat, the, the, the lack of confidence right? The, there's an expectation depending on where you went to school, if you went to school, what you look like, what you drive, where you live, right? There's an expectation of, of having to have all the answers. And when we start coming from a place of wonder and start coming from a place of truth and honesty and saying, I don't know, but let's find out together, right? Like that that's also a way for us to, to build together and also a way to acknowledge that we don't know everything and things are always changing. We say language is powerful, but language is always evolving, right? In doing this work, it's we're constantly educating ourselves. Aaron shared, shared that, you know, we're learning new stuff about each other all the time and we've known each other for 10 years and it's amazing and it's fun. I've, I've known my husband since we were in sixth grade and we're still learning things about each other. I literally just found out he couldn't swim like two years ago. Don't even, that's a whole nother story. But, you know, I mean, 
completely staying in a place of wonder for ourselves as well as for the people around us, it also makes life exciting. We also get to find out more about what we don't know. That's the fun, who we don't know, right? And why we don't know it in order to change it, in order to flip the script, in order to break these cycles. And speaking of cycles, I think we're gonna dive a little bit into the cycle of liberation. We want to free ourselves from this, the, the boxes that we have put ourselves in and the boxes that the people around us have put, put us in, whether we know it or not. Um, and so having this conversation, the first step I know this is something that we can um, also send out, um, Tandra and Sarai, if, if you all um, are interested. But with the cycle of liberation, the first step, the first step on this cycle is about how what brought you to this work, your moment of, of liberation, your moment of freedom, what started you on the journey to, to liberation. Um, and one of the things that uh, Bobby Harrow names as, as liberation is critical transformation. Um, it doesn't always have to be a, a specific moment, but a lot of times it is. Sometimes it's a conversation. Can you all think about as you all have been doing this for, for a while and, and learning new things, do you remember what that moment was that brought you here? I, um, there's so many, right? I feel like there are like different, you know, sort of moments along the way. I think my very first moment, um, uh, I give, um, I, I say that my 12th grade English teacher was one of the catalysts for doing this work, uh, Miss Easy. And we, and I and I have to make the point. She is an Iranian woman, and she went by Miss Easy because uh, we couldn't like nobody could pronounce her name, right? And so even like that is um, it, again like that's that's a whole other session three of like you know the power of even like changing names to uh, to sort of make it easier for other folks. But um, uh, but. She was one of the first, and we read all um, authors that identified as people of color. Um, but I think most recently it was uh, leaving my previous job and understanding that what I was doing was not uh, following the values and filling the bucket of what I wanted to do. Um, and really, um, even in the last couple of years, diving into things in a different way that, that I had ever before um, as a 43 year old, uh, you know, and I'll just name it like, um, and, and so as a, as a white woman, as a woman living in the South, as a queer woman, all of those things, right? Um, and, and I would say that those are, when I, when I got off the hamster wheel and really Perry and I, we believe in the power of language um, and we also believe in the, in the power of the pause. Um, and so when I was able to truly pause and look back on what I had been doing, I, I was doing the work and I, and I wanted to be able to do it in a different way. Um, and so that was kind of my, um, my moment of, of liberation to say like, no, we're gonna, Perry and I are gonna start ACT and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it in a different way. And so I think that, um, that was one of my, my biggest moments um, most recently. I I have to say I feel like like you Erin I think it's been happening all throughout and and really not knowing that this it it's a part of this cycle of liberation I I've been someone that I benefited from mentoring and I'm very passionate about mentoring and I have been doing this throughout the years not knowing that that's what I was doing when I would create access for another young woman or, or provide resources in one way or another. But I have to say the most recent and even doing this type of work in the privilege of sitting in this space in this webinar and uh, along with my colleague Tondra, being able for, a, for us being able as two women of color to create a platform 
where we can bring voices and and provide a space for individuals like Aaron and Perry that are doing incredible work and to reach audiences that are otherwise in one way or another may not be reached at this level, it, it's such a privilege and it's so humbling to, to be able to be in the space and, and carrying that with us and, and being able to continue and reflecting and how is it how is it that we continue this work? How is it that we challenge ourselves and continue growing? And, and to Tondra's point earlier, knowing that we don't know everything and, and being okay to sit in that somewhat of an imposter space and and owning it and and being proud of it yet yet here we are um, with so many others and they I see the hearts there I'm, I'm assuming you all are imposters and or whatever you deal with that with me so <laughs> um it's just amazing so so that's that's my my point of liberation Aaron, do we have time? I don't think we have time because I know we have a, we have a Q and A. Okay, so I won't share my I won't share my moment of liberation, <laughs> but I will tell you that that I'm still on the path, right? I will I will tell you that it is an every day, right? To all of us, welcome to your path, to your new new journey towards freedom, um, towards the unlearning, and it continues every day as you push yourself, and eventually the people around you just got to get in with you, okay? <laughs> I know we have four minutes, we have four minutes. So we wanna um, leave y'all with just some additional resources. Again, take the cycle of socialization, dive into it, reach out to any of us. Um, if you wanna have further conversations, um, uh, we are here to continue doing the work, um, you know, we will have probably a glass of wine with us uh, as we're having these conversations. But um, we have like name dropped Malia um, and I'm going to do it one more time because she's phenomenal. Check out her Embrace online course. Again, like it's an opportunity to do this work a little bit more, um, really looking at privilege and how we can use our privileges to um, to, to do what we call activating, right? Or be an advocate, co-conspirator, whatever it is. Um, I, I love Lupe, did you see, y'all, did you see they want a part three? I'm just gonna like throw it out there. Um, in pursuit of Perry, what uh, another good, very good friend of ours, Jason Soroyce, um, and um, uh, please. Young. Eva, Eva yes. Young. <laughs> Yes, I was like, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting her name? They are doing an incredible podcast and it is essentially um, how do we have these conversations and Perry um, around race, right? Um, and Perry was a guest on it. So go check out In Pursuit Of. It is a podcast. It is awesome. Um, uh, this is Michael Tennant. Um, I met him a couple of weeks ago. He is doing this Empathetic Leadership Fundamentals webinar. I think it's August 2nd uh, in our follow-up email. We will send that out. Um, uh, Perry and I use his Curious Conversations cards and they're phenomenal. So go check out this, um, this webinar on August 2nd. Uh, and this is just something that Perry and I use. These um, We call these our action steps, right? And so again, like use this, um, what work needs doing, what are you good at, and what is your passion, and write that, Perry and I love Venn diagrams, um, and right there in the middle is that is your, those are your action steps, right? And so again, take this, think about it, um, and use it as a resource. Um, Thank you, y'all. Again, Tondra and Sarai, um, we love being with y'all. We can't wait to do something again. Um, and everybody, Perry, you gonna close us out? I was just gonna say thank you all so much for being willing, for for sharing, for for starting your journey, for being in the middle of your journey, for having the the difficult conversations, for doing the mirror work. That's what it's about. For doing the mirror work. Thank you all so much for your time today. Wow. I don't even want it to end and no one else does either. 
Um, and we were chatting for about 30 minutes before this. I think sometimes we should just start recording those and, and using sound bites. I think a, a couple of people would like them. Uh, but maybe there's a part three coming. More to come on that since everyone brought it up. We're going to work on that, you guys. But in the interim, we already have our August webinar planned out. We are going to have Erica Stroman leading us in a conversation on branding. So come and join us next month on August 17th. We'll drop the link in the chat. The title of that webinar is Unleashing the Power of Digital Credentials and Skills, Empowering Career Advancement and Fostering Belonging Within Organizations. When I tell you, you do not want to miss this webinar. When we speak with Erin and Perry, it is like I told them a cup of coffee in the morning. It is like a jolt. You don't even need your coffee, your Celsius, whatever it is that you drink. Erica is the same. I'm telling you, we're keeping this going. So we might have a part three coming a little later, but here's a little intermission in between with Erica bringing that same energy. She facilitated a series for our Inclusive Leadership Summit, and the majority of the feedback we received about our sessions were about her sessions. You don't want to miss it. This is free. So join us. I hope I've rambled on enough as I do on every webinar to give you guys time to go over there and register before we end. Erin, Perry, thank you all so much. To all of those who are in the chat and who are watching this, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for taking the time to share your stories in the chat. We honor the fact that you feel comfortable enough to share that with us, with all of us. Please know that whatever you've shared has enlightened someone today. Join us next month. We hope to see you next month. And then for part three, whenever that will be, we'll send out an email when we let you know. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.